From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm David Feldman. Steve Scrovan is back east visiting family, but we have, as always, the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, David, Jimmy. Japanese prosecutors, Ralph, arrested Carlos Gosen, chairman of Nissan Motor, earlier this week. They got on his private jet in Tokyo, and he could spend up to 10 days in prison. Ralph, when Douglas MacArthur rebuilt Japan, didn't he teach them to respect our corporate elders arresting the chairman of Nissan Motors? Isn't that offensive? Well, an internal Nissan investigation apparently saw that he and an associate underestimated their income in Japan by several millions of dollars. And the internal investigators sent it to the prosecutor. In Japan, they can detain you, unlike in the U.S., where you can get out on bail. They can detain you for 10 days as part of their procedure. When I read about this, it occurred to me this powerful auto executive was charged, and Donald Trump still has his tax return secret. So he better not go to Japan, huh, David? (laughs) (laughs) I read that and I thought, if one corporate CEO spent one night in prison, this would be a different country. The food would be better, too. (laughs) We have Uh, a great international law expert and advocate, Professor Richard Falk. Why don't you introduce him, David? Yes, we have a globally themed show as we turn our attention away from the midterms. First up, we're going to discuss international law and its impact on genocide as well as famine with scholar and activist Professor Richard Falk. That's the first half. During the second half, did you know that eight men have as much wealth as half the world? That's according to Oxfam International. As regular listeners know, Ralph has always warned that too much power in too few hands is not healthy for democracies or our economy. We've done a number of shows that have highlighted this issue. We have spoken to experts Anand Gir Adadas and David Callahan, who have written extensively about the real power dynamics of philanthropy and how it's not always what it appears. We have spoken to experts like Scott Galloway and Nomi Prinz, who warn about the dangers of monopoly in big tech and in finance. Today, we will continue on that theme with author Peter Phillips, who has written a book entitled Giants, the Global Power Elite. Hopefully, we'll find out who those eight men are and what they're up to. And it wouldn't be a show if we also didn't check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's find out if international law can protect the weak from the powerful. Richard Falk is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and visiting Distinguished Professor in Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Professor Falk is the former United Nations Human Rights Rapporteur in the Occupied Territories and the author of many books, including Chaos and Counter-Revolution After the Arab Spring. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Richard Falk. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm a graduate of Princeton, so I'm very familiar with your work there and over in the Middle East. Let's start with a real puzzle. At least it's one to me. Every day there's violations of international law by countries all over the world, and some of them quite blatant, including the U.S., who invaded Iraq without a constitutional declaration of war and without being threatened by Iraq. So that's a criminal war of aggression, which is a violation of the UN Charter, which is a treaty that we were very important in sponsoring back in 1946 period. It occurs to me, where are the international law professors? Why aren't they speaking out? Israel seems to see no reason why it cannot bomb or invade or attack neighboring countries. We have violations in the Far East. We have violations in Central America. Why aren't international law experts at Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, you know, the usual group, why aren't they taking stands? Why aren't they signing letters? Why aren't they writing more op-eds? Because apart from the commercial international law, or what used to be called the law merchant, 
which goes on every day in terms of trading between countries and companies, international law as it relates to the preservation of peace and conflict avoidance seems to be shriveling to almost a state of nothingness. Well, that you put very provocatively, I think, a fundamental question about the viability of international law under current world conditions. And as you say, it works quite well for routine interactions, not only commercial ones and trade, but also maritime safety, public order of the oceans, things like that. But when you get to peace and security issues, it is no better or and no worse than the geopolitics of the dominant countries in the world. And that's been true for a long time. It's accentuated these days because you have these ultranationalist leaders like our own. But the structural reality has been there ever since international law was born. And it's inscribed in the constitutional order of the UN that gives the five victorious countries in World War II veto power, which in effect is saying they have an exemption from obeying international law whenever they see fit, and they can protect their friends also from any kind of accountability under international law, which the U.S. has been doing with respect to Israel rather shamelessly now for decades. Well, as you know, we have overthrown over 50 Government, some of them duly elected, like in 1953, overthrew the duly elected government in Iran, and in about the same time in Guatemala, and it just keeps going on and on. And after a while, the norm becomes intervention. And other countries yes. say, you know, the U.S. does it, we can do it. It seems like a, a double standard here. That is, if our embassy is taken over in Tehran, as it was, by the Khomeini revolution, then we invoke international law. But when it comes to our invasions of countries or other violations, we ignore it or violate it with impunity. So doesn't this raise the question, is there any enforcement arm for international law under treaties or by the UN? Yeah, well, you put your finger on several key issues, and the reality is there's enforcement, but only when it has geopolitical muscle behind it. So if the U.S., for instance, wants to punish Gaddafi's Libya, it could produce something that at least was called enforcement. And there is a pervasive double standards, even after World War II, when German and Japanese leaders were held accountable for war crimes. The crimes of the victors, including the use of atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were accorded impunity. So there's been this double standard throughout. A Mexican delegate, when the UN was first established, said, we've created an organization that holds the mice accountable while the tigers roam free. And there's a lot of truth to that. And as you say, when the embassy was seized by Iran in 1979, we called it a barbaric act of violating international law. But when we do equally flagrant acts that depart from international law, we invoke American exceptionalism and other ways of explaining away our responsibility. Well, most of the time when countries violate international law clearly with military action, they say it's defense. It's for national defense. There isn't anything that Israel's ever done to the surrounding countries. Bombing just recently, many times, Syria, which certainly doesn't threaten them. They're involved in a civil war. It's always, well, it's national defense. Well, there's a federal statute, as you know, that says no U.S. military aid to any country can be used for offensive purposes. And so all the U.S. military aid to Israel over the last 50, 60 years, has never been viewed as used for anything but defensive purposes. What's your comment on that? I mean, that seems so fallacious, like the invasion of Lebanon and the constant incursions and bombings. What's your analysis of the 
lack of any boundaries for the concept under international law of self-defense? Well, I think, again, it's a key issue. You have to distinguish legal rationalizations from legality. And what has been done in relation to Israel is to make rationalizations that there's no political motivation to question within our own domestic political system. So they're accepted on face value, but any kind of third party examination of those rationalizations would dismiss them, almost all of them, because they were not clearly not using force defensively. Well, and in our country, we're violating the charter, but there's no third party mechanism that can override these legal rationalizations that rest on nothing more than an attempt to cover illegality. Not even the international court? Well, the international court depends on the voluntary acceptance of its jurisdiction by states. You remember the Nicaragua case, which was brought by Nicaragua in protest against the mining of their harbors and teaching torture to the Contras. The U.S. backed out of the court, renounced its acceptance of any kind of jurisdiction by the court and refused to be bound by the judgment that resulted. In the end, it did, on supposedly by its own unilateral action, decide to stop mining the harbors, but it did it without any acknowledgement that it was a legal obli obligation to do what it was doing. The UN has the authority to impose sanctions or peace keeping groups, but the veto of the United States or any of the other four countries that have the veto precludes that. So it really, the UN is powerless in this particular area. What I think it's best to understand is that the UN, as an organization, was created to give primacy to geopolitics when it comes to any kind of decisions or enforcement or implementation. So when the geopolitical actors that have the veto can agree, as they did in the first Iraq war back in 92, I think it was, then the UN can be very effective because it has geopolitical muscle behind it. But throughout the whole Cold War and in recent years, it has no capacity to form a consensus and therefore no capacity to implement its preferences or its judgments about who is responsible for what. Well, let's take a look at the Saudi attack on Yemen, which is a, producing a major humanitarian crisis. Tens of thousands of Yemenis have been killed. The Saudis are very sensitive about their southern border. In fact, some of the tribes now are in the ruling part of the Saudi Arabia came from Yemen many, many generations <clears throat> ago. What's the status of international law there? Does the Saudi regime have a claim of self-defense against the Houthis? And if so, does that exonerate the United States from violating international law by supporting with logistics and fueling and equipment the Saudi periodic attacks, very often on civilian targets, hospitals, schools? No, the short answer is no. The Saudis have no convincing legal rationale for what they've been doing to Yemen, and then the specific acts of bombing hospitals and other civilian targets are separate violations of the law of war. And the United States is complicit in both the aggression by Saudi Arabia against Yemen and the specific violations to the extent that it has knowledge and continues to contribute materially to the Saudi policies of aggressive war. You mentioned the law of war. Where is that rooted in? in? There's a basic division between the law of war, that is, what states supposedly can do in the course of war, which goes back to the Hague Conventions of the early 20th century, especially the Hague Convention on Land Warfare in 1907. And then there's the international humanitarian law, which was basically developed in the four Geneva Conventions 
that were adopted in 1949 after World War II and tried to fill the gap in the law of war that existed because prisoners of war were not being protected and a situation where a civilian population is subject to belligerent occupation was not covered by the law of war. So international humanitarian law is an attempt to reconcile the conduct of war with a maximum effort to protect those that are innocent. And it turns out, as you've written, more countries are using intervention under the cover of humanitarian intervention. Can you discuss that? Why do they do that? Well, because the UN doesn't have an effective, persuasive power to determine when the use of force is justified, unless the Security Council mandates the use of force as it did against Iraq back in 1992, each country basically can call whatever it does a name that mobilizes public support. And so humanitarian intervention is what Noam Chomsky, for instance, has called military humanism. It's an attempt to paper over the use of force in very controversial, non-defensive situations. Kosovo was an example back in 1999, where NATO intervened supposedly to protect the Kosovo majority from Serbian uh, atrocities. But there was no legal mandate given by the UN, and therefore the only legal use of force would have been self-defense, and Kosovo and Serbia were not in any way engaged in attacking any other country. You know, it seems to me, just looking over the decades, that there there were bursts of energy in establishing international treaties back several decades ago. I mean, for whatever they're worth, I mean, they are porous, but we do have nuclear arms control agreements. We do have the anti-proliferation agreement with many countries. We have uh, international treaties on uh, biological and chemical warfare, but there's almost nothing going on right now on cybersecurity or cyber warfare, which is being conducted by everybody, not just the the so-called Russian intrusion, but we're embedded in their infrastructure and China's embedded in ours and we're embedded in China and there's war going on, cyber war. No one is taking any leadership to initiate negotiations for an international treaty. Is that correct? No, you're quite right, Ralph. But you have to examine treaty by treaty. For instance, you mentioned non-proliferation treaty, which is probably the most important treaty in the nuclear domain. But that's a treaty that serves the interests of these geopolitical actors because it's really saying the danger of nuclear weapons comes not from the countries that possess them, but from the countries that don't, who might want them. And so these treaties, especially in the peace and security area, are treaties that reflect the interests at the time of the governments that sponsor them. And the U.S. had an interest after World War II in creating this liberal international order, which they wanted it to be rule-based. So they did a lot to generate international agreements that were comprehensive and to a large extent benefited the international community as a whole. But in recent years, and particularly since the end of the Cold War, the U.S. has pursued a kind of unilateral diplomacy in which it has not wanted to be in any way constrained by international law. And that comes not just from the White House and executive office, but it's also embedded in this shift to the right domestically that's reflected in Congress. For instance, the Kyoto Protocol, which was an early attempt to limit carbon emissions that were causing global warming. No president, including Clinton, were able even to submit that to the Senate for ratification. There was so much opposition. So the domestic political climate is very hostile to relying on international law as a way 
to uphold American foreign policy objectives. And that even, explains the yes. weakness in this yes. current period. Even worse, today we have this prospect where the national security advisor to Donald Trump is John Bolton, graduate of Yale Law School, and he writes articles before he assumed his post, which is actually should be confirmable, but it wasn't, saying we should bomb North Korea, we should overthrow the regime in Iran. He has no sensitivity whatsoever to international legal restraints or treaties or anything of that sort. And the new Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo, the same way, graduate of Harvard Law School, you wonder what they learned. And the rumors in Washington is that if Trump is cornered by the Mueller investigation and he doesn't see a way out, that he puts Pompeo as Secretary of Defense, replaces Mathis, and replaces his chief of staff, retired General Kelly, and puts another John Bolton type there and starts a war against Iran in order to distract attention from his domestic troubles. Are there any legal restraints here? I mean, other than the nominal impeachment remedy? Uh, the only really legal restraints are dependent on the political will of those that have the legal authority. And so far, there's been, in my view, a very disappointing dereliction of constitutional responsibility by Congress in not calling Trump to account for any number of things. But you're right, John Bolton has attacked the International Criminal Court recently as a illegitimate institution, and it should be abolished, and it has no authority and lots of other things. So that there's a consistent pattern now of saying international law serves the weak and should not be adhered to by countries that pursue their interests for their own benefit. So national interest under a Trump presidency consistently overrides the claims of international law. You know, I can hear our listeners saying, well, you know, if the people are sovereign, why can't people sue in federal court to stop this illegality by the government that they have delegated their sovereign power to? Why don't you explain how the courts have ducked and the doctrines they use to duck citizen suits to yes, make their the, own government citizen, adhere? During the Vietnam War, particularly, Lots of citizens tried to hold the government to account under international law. And the courts did two main things to prevent that from ever happening. One was to say citizens had no what they call justiciable interest, and therefore they had no standing to make yes. such a legal complaint. And the second thing was to say that the questions being raised by the citizen complaints were quote unquote political questions and therefore exclusively subject to executive or presidential authority. Would you call uh, those ruses? Well, they represented a sort of Hamiltonian view of government that you need a strong executive for foreign policy that the Congress doesn't really understand. I mean, it represents a idea of government that doesn't fit the realities of the 20th, much less the 21st century. But I wouldn't say it's purely a ruse. It's a sort of anachronistic view of how states, including powerful ones like our own, should operate in the world. I've long held the view that the U.S. and the American people would be better off if our leaders felt constrained by international law and that when we violated it, it's usually done damage to our own interests as well as our capacity to exert positive leadership in the world, the Vietnam War being a classic instance of this. Your observation raises the hypocritical issue of our judiciary, which is the conservatives on the Supreme Court have been spectacular judicial activists, overturning congressionally enacted statutes, blocking people with the lacking standing to sue, 
And going back to the 1880s, actually giving artificial entities called corporations personhood, qualifying them for rights under the 14th Amendment. So it's sort of like our attitude toward international law. When it serves our purpose, we invoke it. And when it doesn't serve our purpose, we find reasons to ignore or violate it. I want to get into the Israeli Middle East area very quickly with some questions you may have never been asked, but they're very (laughs) constructive. And two in particular. One is, why haven't the leaders of the peace movement in Israel or the opposition to Netanyahu on the mistreatment of Palestinians, which involve, as the movie The Gatekeepers showed, former retired heads of the Mossad and heads of the Shin Bit and ministers of justice, mayors of Haifa, very prominent people. Why have they not demanded to be heard at a congressional hearing in the last 60 years, the opposing view to AIPAC and the Israeli military regime has never had a congressional hearing. And the pro-Palestinian groups in the U.S., including Jewish Voices for Peace, should they be asking? I mean, what's the problem here? It's very hard for Congress to turn down these former leaders in Israel as they might turn down some citizen advocates here because of AIPAC's pressure. Isn't that yeah. a good idea? Yeah, I think it's an excellent idea, but you have to mobilize those people to step outside their own national frame of reference to do that. It would take a major campaign, I think, to motivate them to do that. But it would be quite an effective initiative. As far as within the country is concerned, you mentioned Jewish Voice for Peace and there are other groups, too. There's no sufficient countervailing force to APAC to give congressional people the incentive to hear both sides. And where a pressure group is not neutralized, at least to some degree, by a countervailing force, there's no upside for the politician to take a balanced view. And that's Israel's the classic example of that interplay of power and law, where law is completely suppressed by the primacy of politics. There's more than one sign in the Haaretz newspaper that these former heads of powerful institutions in Israel would be eager to come and testify for the Senate Foreign Relations or House Foreign Relations Committee. And that would, of course, generate a lot of news coverage and perhaps begin to dilute some of the opposition. I mean, it's pretty hard to turn these people down. They're very prominent people in the national security area. They support the Iran nuclear deal against the erosive impact of Prime Minister Netanyahu, as you've pointed out in your articles. Well, anyway, the next question I want to ask is the attacks on Gaza by the Israelis not only the major invasions, but the periodic skirmishes are entirely justified by the rockets fired from the garages in Gaza. These are crude rockets that fortunately, 98% of them fall on the desert floor and whatever injuries occurred, it's far less than what the Israelis have suffered from friendly fire in their war in Gaza. And yet it's quite clear that The Israelis know where these garages are. National security experts have said the minute the rocket is fired, it takes three to four seconds for the Israelis to know the source, and they can fire a missile at it. They know everything about Gaza down to the DNA of some of these families. They know who's going to weddings, who's who's going to be in what homes for gatherings. They have informants everywhere. It's the most explicit surveillance state in the history of the world with modern electronic technology. So the question is, why hasn't this been exposed? That if you eliminate the rocket self-defense issue, you eliminate the only pretext they really have left for bombarding Gaza and inflicting horrific casualties on children and innocents. There are several points in your assessment of the situation. The first is that these rockets are not really the provocation for the Israeli attacks. 
These demonstrations near the Gaza fence were initiated largely by civil society, almost totally by civil society. They were unarmed, and Israel used excessive force and collective punishment, which both are unlawful tactics, to inflict huge casualties on these demonstrators when they had all the technique and capabilities of controlling the demonstrations without inflicting lethal injuries. They know better than probably any country in the world how to manage crowd control and demonstrations. So they deliberately chose to engage in these kind of tactics of excessive force because their objective at this point is to make the Palestinians feel that they are pursuing a lost cause and should politically surrender. That's the Trump policy and that's the Netanyahu policy. And these various dramas that cause great suffering have to be understood and interpreted in light of this broader context. And in that sense, what has been happening on the Gaza border is an extraordinary demonstration of the Palestinian desperation to show that their resistance is still a living reality. You know, in your writings, you defined the conventional definition of terrorism as political attacks on innocent civilians with carnage. And certainly in terms of the numbers, the U.S. has killed far more innocent civilians in places like Iraq or caused conditions by blowing up infrastructure. Innocent civilians in Iraq, the figure is over one million. And the Israelis are now inflicting at the ratio of at least 400 to one casualties, fatalities and injuries on Palestinians compared to what is inflicted on Israeli innocent civilians. So the state terrorism is far, far greater than non-state terrorism in your judgment. So yeah. why is it that the U.S. has designated Hamas and Hezbollah as terrorist organizations? What would be your rebuttal of that? Well, they're designated as such because they're political adversaries of the U.S. And both of them have sought to find ways of reaching political accommodations, particularly in recent years. So the notion that they should be isolated as terrorist organizations is a purely political cover for justifying Israeli and U.S. violence. It is really it has no roots in the objective facts that condition the behavior of these various actors. Hamas is far from a perfect political organization, but it recognizes that its future is based on political action at this point, not on engaging in violence. These rocket attacks only occur after rather severe Israeli provocation. And this provocation in this instance was not only the excessive force at the border, but also Israeli special forces penetrated Gaza and killed seven Palestinian militants. And the rockets were fired in response to that act. So you have to look at the timeline when these rocket attacks occur. And as you say, even when they occur, they're mainly symbolic gestures. And the Hamas has refrained from using its more advanced munitions, which could inflict real damage. It wants not to have the violence escalated. And as you say, Hezbollah defended its territory against Israeli occupation, is now in the Lebanese parliament, a major coalition with other groups, and has protected Lebanon from the spillover from Syria, which we might want to talk about someday, but we're running out of time. But let me ask this last question. You've questioned the Saudi Israeli coalition against Iran. You said that the Iran nuclear deal was one sided to the advantage of the US and Israel, the opposite of what Trump is saying. What do you think of the recent events in terms of this coalition staying together against Iran and Turkey? 
Well, I think it's highly irresponsible and provocative and could degenerate into a regional war with much suffering added to the present turmoil. And with a leader such as we have in the White House, it's a very dangerous situation that has no justification in law, morality, or in my judgment, in politics. It's purely an effort to exert hegemonic control over the Middle East, and it has a sectarian dimension of the Sunni Saudis versus the Shia Iranians. And Iran has acted in some of these other conflicts, but in a relatively minor way except Syria, and it's done far less to disrupt the stability of the region than Saudi Arabia or the U.S. or Israel have done. Well, on that note, let me ask, what are you working on next? You're a prolific writer. You travel to gatherings in Europe and elsewhere trying to uphold international law, keep the norms alive, so to speak. What are you uh, well, writing Well, I, con- I continue to work on the sort of stuff we've been talking about, and I'm maybe with a hubris or, or senility, I'm not sure which, trying to write a memoir. Well, we look forward to that. You've also written a poem, and you've got legions of students who you've taught over the years. Your integrity is impeccable. You represented the UN and Israel and were rather mistreated and obstructed by the Israeli government. But the international law specialists, I think, need to be heard from more vigorously whether before congressional hearings, which may be made available in the new House of Representatives, and definitely in terms of more petitions and joint letters. I think that doesn't get anything done directly, but it keeps the standards of international law alive against the brute force of military power. Let me make just one final point about the role of international lawyers in this country. See, most of them overwhelmingly, especially at these leading universities, are much more interested in being called upon to advise the U.S. government than to act as a source of objective assessment of whether the policies are legal or not. So you can't realistically look to these institutions and these experts as a source of constraint. It's unfortunate, but it's part of the reality. And hopefully, Congress now, because of its somewhat altered character, may see the opportunity to use international law to constrain in certain ways the Trump foreign policy and some of his lieutenants like Bolton and Pompeo and others. Indeed. And maybe a subcommittee, the House Judiciary Committee, can start having hearings on the status of international law. Thank you very much, Professor Richard Falk. I hope we can continue this discussion. Thank you, Ralph. Your your issues were excellent from my point of view. You really put your finger on many of the crucial questions of world order that face the peoples of the world, not only Americans. Thank you. And just for our listeners, Professor Falk has written a very incisive piece on Trump and Trumpism, far more detailed and insightful than most of the easy assaults on Trump's tweets. How can they get that, Professor Falk? Well, I guess the easiest way is through my blog, which is richardfalk.wordpress.com. And that's spelled F-A-L-K. Thank you very much, Richard. Good, Ralph. Great talking. Thank you. Take care. We have been speaking with Professor Richard Falk. We will link to his important work at the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. Right now, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will find out about the real-life giants who have as much wealth as half the entire world and what that means for the rest of us. Let's go to our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back in a minute. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, November 23, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. 
The German Chemical Industry Association, a partner of the prominent anti-corruption NGO Transparency International, has lobbied European Union officials in opposition to strengthening whistleblower rights in the EU. Berlin-based Transparency International had been advocating for improved whistleblower protections throughout Europe for the last decade. Yet, it entered into a formal partnership this year with the German Chemical Industry Association, which has lobbied against this. Mark Wirth of the European Center for Whistleblower Rights told Corporate Crime Reporter last week that Transparency International has abandoned its long-held mission to defend and protect the public interest by allowing itself to be corrupted by some of the largest corporate interests in Germany. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mulcarber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is David Feldman. Steve Scrovan is off this week, and Ralph Nader, of course, is here. Our next guest is going to tell us who really controls the world's wealth. Peter Phillips is a professor of political sociology at Sonoma State University and former director of Project Censored and former president of Media Freedom Foundation. He has written or co-authored a number of books about politics and media. His most recent book is Giants, the Global Power Elite. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Phillips. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Indeed. Let's get one shibboleth out of the way here. The minute people of some persuasions hear about the global power elite, they say, oh, there go the conspiracy theorists again. I always react in two ways. One way is, you know, there are powerful people who work together and plan together and strategically plan to get their way in the world. If that's a conspiracy, that's the dictionary definition. And the second is that there are wild conspiracy theories that may be plausible, but they're not evidential. They're not accurate. Your work, Peter Phillips, is very evidence-based, and you are basically stating that the course of human history has always concentrated power in the hands of a few over thousands of years, every culture, every society. And now that we are into this age of globalism, they're operating globally. So having said that, how would you summarize this prodigious work of yours, which is 380 pages called Giants, the Global Power Elite, published just recently by Seven Stories Press in New York City. How would you summarize it if someone asked you in the New York Times, you know, that column that they have by John William, five things about your book? Okay, here's the first thing I want to ask you. What is this book about? It's about concentrated global capital. And who are the people that control it? And we're looking at the companies, the transnational investment companies that have over a trillion dollars worth of capital that they manage. There are 17 of them in 2017. They collectively manage $41 trillion worth of wealth, and they're only controlled by 199 people on their board of directors. So we look at this list of 199 people, and we examine who they are and their backgrounds and their net worth, their public net worth. And we see some very, you know, very similar patterns. I mean, there's a sociology here that's somewhat collective in that these people have very shared interests. They know each other. They interact together often in Davos and other transnational policy groups. And they're simply managing the core amount of money in global capitalism today. I mean, a trillion is a thousand billions. So if we're talking here 40 trillion, it's probably 50 trillion today, is this massive amount of capital. And they get to make the decisions as to where that's invested, what the policies will be around it. And their biggest problem is they got too much capital to invest in safe places. So the result is that they're doing speculative investments like the subprime mortgage loans that we saw almost collapse the entire economy in 2008. They got bailed out from that. So they have all this money now that they're trying to invest in different places. One of the ways that they do that is to invest in public resources. So they want to buy up anything they can get a return on. It could be freeways, it could be universities, it can be water rights globally. So they're trying to you know, buy up the public domain. That's one way of using excess capital. And the other way of using excess capital is permanent war. So we're preparing for war, we're engaged in war, the U.S. military empire and NATO have troops all over the world, 800 bases, and that's using up capital that they get a return on. So this core center piece of transnational capital, and I say transnational, there's people from most of the capitalist nations in the world, 
that are in this little tiny network. And that's the sociology of it. What's interesting is, of course, money and profit and power are what bind them together. And they're very, quite diverse. You know, they're from many ethnic groups, many countries, many religious backgrounds. That isn't what binds them together. It's money, power, and control, right? Correct. But they're still mostly white males from Europe or North America. But they have representatives from people all over the world. So More and more, more and more from Asia. Increasingly, yes. yeah. Yeah, You know, the billionaires know no national boundaries. Tell us how this book is organized. Well, we start out by identifying the directors of the 17 transnational companies. And one of the big things we talk about in that capacity is that they're all interconnected. They're all invested in each other. So these 17 giants, we call them, transnational trillion-dollar companies, They all invested each other. That was pretty amazing as we were looking at that through the NASDAQ investment backgrounds, portfolios on these companies. I started to notice, wow, they're all invested in BlackRock. They're all invested in Chase Manhattan. So just in the NASDAQ, it's over $400 these 17 companies show. So they're one vast network of interconnected capital that's global, and that all governments, all intelligence agencies, all military groups, you know, and business policy groups are in support of protecting that capital growth, that capital's ability to penetrate anywhere in the world, and to make sure they have debt collection. So well, you, that you... is the core idea. The transnational capitalist class, you know, 1% of the global is a lot of people, millions. But this is the central core of that class. This is the 1,000th of 1%. It's actually far less than that. And we're looking at these individuals, 389 are named in the book. Not only are they controlling the investment capital, but they're on various policy groups that are non-governmental. We all hear about the G7 and the G20 and the World Bank and all of that, but these private policy groups where capital people are engaged in making policy, like the Council of 30, as 32 people, some of the heads of various countries and banks, 31 of them are men. And when they put out a policy position, they're totally privately funded. They put out a policy position. The World Bank sees that as instructions, not just recommendations. So they have a huge amount of power. The other big one is the Trilateral Commission, originally funded by Rockefeller, started in the 70s, now has representatives from over 40 nations in it. And they don't allow people who are in government. They only want high-level business people to advise them. And they put out policy reports that are international. So they put out a policy report in 2015 that really said we had to go back to containment with Russia. And we've seen a very strong policy towards Russia and Putin ever since. So, you know, the Trilateral Commission, the Council of 30, the other big one is the Atlantic Council. This is made up from organizations that are in NATO and have representatives. It's based in Washington. They put out policy recommendations for regime changes and how U.S. NATO needs to protect global capital around the world. I mean, and it's all private. And you you have some presidents of universities here who are connected with gigantic mutual funds. They're on the boards of different kinds of large nonprofits while they're running the university. It isn't just multi-billionaires. It's power in its various manifestations. If listeners say, you know, what's that got to do with them? Well, let's, let's just try one example. You got millions of people who can't pay their bills. They go to these payday loan shops and sign these contract servitude, fine print agreements. And these payday loan businesses get their financing often from Wall Street banks, from big multinational banks, because all this money sloshing around, trillions of dollars, they don't know what to do with. They find very, very nefarious ways, not just the arms industry and military industry. You have in your book that they bought up 30 million acres of land in Africa, these giant plantation restoration projects that they have there with untold harm to the small African farmers and sharecroppers. And that's beginning to spread also into South America. Let me put this question to you. We're talking to Peter Phillips, the author of Giants, the Global Power Elite, just out, Seven Stories Press. Wealth is becoming more and more concentrated in fewer hands. And earlier in the program, David Feldman mentioned that you had focused on seven hyper-super-wealthy people. 
whose wealth equals the combined wealth of the bottom three billion plus people on earth. Who are those people? Well, Jeff Bezos is the number one, and he gets a lot of attention. You know, he's the richest man in the world. He has $160 billion worth of wealth. But part of that is because the investment giants see Amazon as a place for good return. And there's massive investment, billions. I mean, some of these companies have $50 billion or more in Amazon. And that just helps... They see that by investing, they're raising the stock value. They're getting a return, but Bezos becomes the richest man in the world. So this is deliberate. And we all know about Bill Gates and that, but they're just big trees in a forest. This book is about the sociology of the forest. It's like a redwood forest where all the trees are interconnected in their roots. Those roots, that's capitalism. That's capital. And they know each other, they interact. And so I don't even list Bezos as one of the top 300 global elites. He certainly could be classified that way, but he's not interconnected in all of the policy councils that these people are. That's what's controlling global capital. That's the direction that it's moving. So he puts his money in one of these global giants as well, any excess capital he has, as did Obama, as does Trump. And, you know, there's 2,000 plus billionaires in the world and 36 million millionaires. That's who has their excess capital is being managed by companies like BlackRock. BlackRock is based in New York. They control $6 trillion worth of capital investment and Obama's money. They also control trillions of dollars of worker pension funds. Absolutely. I mean, this is amazing, the split between ownership of these monies by workers and their control is seized by these giant firms. On Chapter 7 and 8, because I, I want... In the remaining time, you have a chapter that says Facing the Juggernaut, Democracy Movements and Resistance. And then you have an interesting postscript, a letter to the global power elite. Do you want to summarize both of those, Peter Phillips? Well, one of the things we end up with a book with is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think is a very vital instrument developed over 70 years ago after World War II, passed by all the nations in the world. It's not a treaty. It's a moral code of standards for what it means, what human rights are. And so we're saying that the inequality that the global elites are creating today, where 80% of the people in the world live on less than $10 a day and half the people live on less than 250 a day, that mass inequality is only increasing. And they believe that by growing capitalism, they can grow out of that and it'll trickle down to everybody in the world. But that's not happening. We're losing the world environmentally, and wealth is concentrated more among elites and the global transnational class, the top 1%. So that's a big problem. We write a letter, Dear Global Power Elite. We list 389 of you in the book, and you should be honored and proud of your station. But also, this means you're a key part of managing, supporting, protecting major portions of the world's wealth. And it's not possible that you can sustain wealth concentration it's not sustainable. And that creates the difficulties both environmentally and for economic collapse that could bring about global crisis, wars, billions of people could die. I think this is fairly imminent. And we have 90 of my associates and friends and other professors sign this letter. And we just simply say it's no longer acceptable for you to believe that you can manage capitalism to grow its way out of the gross inequalities we now face. The environment cannot accept more pollution and waste. Civil unrest everywhere is inevitable at some point. Humanity needs you to step up and ensure that trickle-down becomes a river of resources that reaches every child, family, and all human beings. And so we're saying, and we're going to have to pressure them to do this, but elites, you know, are, they're people. They have grandkids. They don't want the world to end, and they're endangering the entire planet, and we have to convince them that they can help stop this in addition to social movements and power of resistance by human beings. You have to save them from themselves in order to save the globe. That's what this letter's about. <clears throat> and you're understating because the threat of global pandemics, epidemics, and not enough investment, they have trillions of dollars. They don't know productively what to do with it. It's really quite interesting. They're buying stock buybacks, $7 trillion in the last 10 years, U.S. companies. Apple announced earlier this year they were going to buy back $100 billion of their stock. That's billion. That's 13 years budget the Centers for Disease Control, dealing with global pandemics that know no barrier, of course. 
and it's 200 years of the budget of the federal government's Occupational Safety and Health Agency. And guess how many people made that decision? Tell me what your best guess is. Never mind all the shareholders and mutual funds and pension funds that own stock in Apple. How many people made the decision to use $100 billion of stockholders' wealth and Less buy back dozen, the probably. stock? Hmm? About a dozen. If that. Yeah. My guess is two made the decision. It was rubber stamped by the board of directors. So it's not just concentration of wealth. It's concentration of decisional power and control. The one fact that really gets me is 30,000 people a day die in the world from starvation and malnutrition. Totally preventable. That's every day. It's 10 million a year. There's more than enough food to feed everybody. It's just not profitable to sell that food. So a third of all the food in the world is wasted and thrown away. Nine million people die from air pollution in the world. I'm going to ask you this question. Some listeners are going to laugh. Have you had an interview on NPR or PBS for this book, Giants, the Global Power Elite? There isn't one like it. No, we've tried. We've sent books out to them. We've been pushing Unbelievable. Uh, you know, them to do it, but no, no, we haven't had any response. Have you been on the Terry Gross show? No. Unbelievable. Joshua Johnson show? Those are no, in- mostly Pacifica shows and, you know, some independent radio stations around the country, but no, nothing big like that. Pick I'm up hoping the phone, that listeners. It'll start to happen. I mean, this book is, I think, extremely important and powerful because we name all the people. And, of course, you're not going to like it if you're in the book and you get named, but it's all public information. If you're on a board of directors, then public record will show what stocks you have in your net worth, how much you're paid to be on that board. That's an important point, listeners. Pick up the phone. Call your local NPR station, whether it's WAMC in Albany or the stations in California or Florida. Ask them why they don't have Peter Phillips on. Ask them how they compare the importance of what he has to convey with the usual programming that they have, never mind the music. We've been talking with Peter Phillips, the author of Giants, the Global Power Elite, just published a look at the top 389 most powerful people in world capitalism, published by Seven Stories Press. To be continued, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Ralph. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of this show will eventually appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. Join us next week for another informative and provocative episode of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, listeners. Uh, the Rats Reform Congress dot org is not only a way to get how the rats reform the Congress autograph, but it shows you the reason for the book and how to form a congressional rat watchers group in your congressional district. Clear, concise, informative material to get you underway at whatever level. Thank you. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, and welcome to The Wrap-Up, where David asks a question of Professor Peter Phillips. You teach a course in the sociology of conspiracy theories. So how do you reconcile conspiracy theories with this this conspiracy? I don't use use the word conspiracy anywhere in the the Giants book. Yeah. It's just but it is there. a conspiracy. Well, it's but it's so public. I mean, all all everybody in Congress admits. Well, we're in capital. I heard Pelosi say this. We're a capitalist society. We have to maintain that that structure. That's our vital interest. <laughs> That's right. She said. That. <laughs> I've been paying attention to Facebook and how they build up the the myth of Mark Zuckerberg that he's a genius. Is it fair to say that once you get an investor, an angel investor? putting money into Facebook, like Peter Thiel, I understand, was one of the original venture capitalists who put money into Facebook. You can't pitch an idea, an invention to Mark Zuckerberg, unless it's filtered through the original angel investors. And so Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook end up buying ideas only from the angel investors who bring those ideas to them. Is that a fair assessment of how... I'm not sure how that mechanism would work. I believe that these people talk to each other all the time, but all 17 of the giants are heavily invested in Facebook. Right, Microsoft. Billions and billions of dollars. And then on top of that, it was the Atlantic Council, the private, you know, non-governmental policy group 
of NATO representatives that recommended who should be purged in Facebook. They were the ones that took the 900 people and sites that were purged just a few months ago yeah. from all the Facebook networks, and the Atlantic Council identified it. So they're part of my power elite group. So I'm saying that they're the ones that are deciding the security mechanisms that Facebook is implementing worldwide. That's pretty fascinating. And now Ralph answers a couple of listener questions. Our first question comes from Nancy Lizza. She writes, on the show with Mark Green two weeks ago, one of your hosts asked both you and Mr. Green if you thought the dumbing down of Americans was deliberate. She says you didn't answer the question. How would you both have answered that? Well, that's the way the power structure has always worked for centuries. They try to deceive people so people don't get smart about the evidence. They use bias slogans and suck people into mouthing them. Madison Avenue has deceptive ads in order to divert people's attention, such as in the old days, from fuel efficiency and safety and pollution control factors in buying a car to power, horsepower and style. And so that's, that's the communication process. I prefer to use the word, they deliberately try to stupefy people. It's often very hard to get the record of a politician compared to the rhetoric that's all over TV and on the hustings. That's a way to stupefy people, to deprive them of the kind of information that would make them very smart about the decisions that they've been asked to make, pro or con. Do you think the Powell memo was deliberate in trying to create low information voters? Well, the Power Memorandum was designed to build a corporate strategy to retaliate against the expanding consumer worker environmental movements in the 60s and the legislation they got through Congress. I think it was a power memorandum, not just trying to develop purely a propaganda campaign, although that was part of the memorandum. This next question comes from David Schoenfeld from Connecticut, writes in, he would like to know what Ralph's philosophy is on charitable giving. Well, he makes a good point. You know, is it better to give a lot of small amounts to more organizations who do good works or concentrate larger amounts and fewer? And that's not something that has a, a strong rule to it at all. You just have to figure out, do a lot of small contributions in your name, give a morale boost, not just a financial boost to these groups. And if you have larger contributions to fewer groups, you might be gravitating to the larger groups who are having a bigger range of impact. So it's really a judgment call, depending on where you live, what your interests are, what your temperament is, and whether you know the people, whether you want to ask them to adopt a certain agenda that's within their philosophy, but they haven't adopted it. So just use your good judgment. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when we tell the story of the power of a small town newspaper with Art Cullen of the Storm Lake Times. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting ready.